Hello everyone, I'm Vivi and welcome to Kingdom Hearts Dark Road Explained. Let's first go over the names of all of our characters involved, or rather, our 13 lights. Pronouncing the names to the best of my ability, we have Xehanort, Ericus, Erd, Hermode, Ver, and Braggy. As for our upper classmates, we have Helgi, Vala, Heimdall, Sigrun, Vidar, and Heder. All names of these upper classmates are from Norse mythology, fun fact. As for the title, 13 Lights, we'll get to that later on in the video. Now, to give you all a quick summary of the main events which occurred, while still searching for the upper classmates as instructed by Odin, we stumble on Ver, who for some reason had decided to wander off on her own. We team up and a point comes where our characters wonder how to really defeat darkness. Ver explains she found an all-knowing mirror, and that's pretty much where the story starts taking a huge turn. While asking the mirror about the whereabouts of the upper classmates, Vidar shows up and tells Ver he needs her help. At that moment, Vidar questioning Ver creates conflicted feelings. She thinks back to her talking to the mirror, wondering if she'll ever become a Keyblade Master. So these thoughts in her head, whether to venture on with her friends or not, well in the end she decides to go on with Vidar. As we explore more worlds, we realize that the goal of the upperclassmen is to steal items which maintain the world's order or balance. They believed these objects would help them defeat darkness, but in the end, they never went through with it and just returned the items and let them be. Vidar also believed they needed seven lights to defeat true darkness, lights which they've lost. A task with which they'd have Ver's help. The team reports back their revelations to Master Odin, realizing that Vidar trying to gather light, and the whole enigma surrounding Kingdom Hearts, he believed it was best to relieve his students from their duty. Afterwards, they all stumble on Baldur. He explains they no longer need to worry about looking for his sister, Hodder, who was an upper classmate. Baldur explains that she passed after trying to protect him from Maleficent. So he says. We'll get to that later. After overhearing Braggy's joke of an attempt to find out more about True Darkness, Baldur brings up the Underworld. They stumble on Hades, win the tournament, and are sent to the Underworld as per Hades' deal. Then they ask Hades if they can talk to their disappeared friend, which Hades refers to as dead. His new deal or terms, if he finds Hodder, one of them has to stay behind. Well, that doesn't end up happening. Before they all got sucked into that gate, Ericus and Xehanort not only find Hodder's spirit, but others, Heimdall, Helgi, and Sigrun. What they recall is failing to defeat the evil fairy, Maleficent in this case, and finding themselves bodiless in pretty much the final world. They aren't certain of this formless darkness which our duo brings up, but they do share their own view on light versus darkness, how it's all about different beliefs. Now before their time's up, Hodder asks Xehanort a favor, and that favor leads us to a battle with Baldur. We soon realize that losing Hodder took a large toll on Baldur, so much in fact, darkness overtook him. He was the one who killed all other classmates. As you can see here, he easily kills everyone until Master Odin comes to their aid. Finally, Xehanort goes for the final strike, and after all this ordeal, Ericus and Xehanort are soon tasked to go through the mark of mastery. Master Odin wishes his students, Ericus and Xehanort, to take his place so that he retires and leaves Scala at Kylum. And that's pretty much it for the main events of Dark Road. You perhaps felt like the upper classmen weren't shown on screen too often. Nomura actually admits that he had wished to dive deeper into their character development. However, the game would have been far too extensive. Then he adds, by the way, this is from the Q&A which commemorated Dark Road's finale. Most of the characters will probably not appear in future stories, but if the opportunity arises, I would love to depict them in other forms of media. Could other forms of media be novels? Manga? Or TV series even? Well, that's one of nature's mysteries. So moving on, Dark Road's remaining episodes and finale also feature a bunch of interesting scenes and flashbacks and we'll start to go through them one by one. First and foremost, before the credits roll, we get our epilogue. The one who decides to show up right after we leave is Braggy. Or should I say, Lushu. One pattern I've noticed with this guy. The first letter of every vessel we know of him so far. Brain, Braggy, and Brag. The letter B. 
Perhaps symbolic if you think about it, B is the second letter of the alphabet, Lu Xu being the second closest to the master of masters, following him in other words. Now two things to look at here, number one, the chosen one. What does he mean by that? Well, if we go back to Secret Report 12 in KH3, one line by Lu Xu says, Somewhere in this cyclical history of bequeathings, a chosen one will appear and reenact the Keyblade War. He does say Xehanort could be useful, little did he know that Xehanort would actually turn out to be the chosen one later in the future. A question that's probably been floating around for ages, why is old man Xehanort bald? As funny as this may sound, we've probably always wondered if him losing hair was an aftermath of darkness. Well, we pretty much got confirmation twice. The first one is from the commemorative Q&A which Nomura shared shortly after Dark Road's finale update. You said that the mystery of why Xehanort went bald would be answered, but it ended up being unexpectedly straightforward. Yes, it wasn't really a very important issue after all. It's just that people were wrongly theorizing that it fell out after many years, so I wanted to correct the record that he shaved it. This was also hinted at in-game, Xehanort revisits the mirror 64 years later. He wonders if it recognizes him, and uh, notices he's missing hair. He then puts his hand on his head and says, a demonstration of my resolve. In Japan, shaving hair could mean apology, or just the act of cutting hair could represent a new beginning. Xehanort uses the word resolve. Another word we could use is determination. Old man Xehanort is determined to pursue his new path. While speaking to the mirror, Xehanort mentions he will always have a special place in his heart for these friends he's dreamt of as a young lad, friends he's never met in real life. Efforts of finding them has never been a success, all he knows about them are their faces. He asks the mirror if they really existed, or rather if they were a figment of his imagination. Mirror explains that they did exist, even without knowing their names. Mirror also believes that Xehanort's heart speaks more clearly than his words. Just what friends is he referring to? Well, if we quickly jump into the secret ending, toddler Xehanort talks about his dream, referring to the five Union leaders from Union Cross. Curly silver hair, ephemer. Black clothes and a hat, brain. Pink hair, skinny boy, lorium. Quiet boy, blonde hair, ventus. Girl with dark hair just like his mom, scald? Wait, his mom? We'll talk about that later on in the video. Then there's this other person. Someone who reminds him of his caretaker here. Now back to the scene with the mirror. Xehanort's curiosity leads towards the whereabouts of Ventus. Mirror describes the Keyblade graveyard, that being the whereabouts of one of his friends from his dreams. You might wonder, how did Ventus end up in Birth by Sleep's timeline again? Well, he did use a lifeboat and found himself in the Keyblade graveyard. This scene from Union Cross's finale seems to be pointing at Xehanort finding Ventus. Dark Road's remaining episodes also feature recreated scenes from Birth by Sleep. One of them is the one where Ericus and Xehanort have a disagreement, Xehanort wanting to summon Kingdom Hearts. The scene plays out exactly the same, but right at the end, the screen goes black and we have Ericus's new dialogue. I knew it. Xehanort, he could never let it go. The scene we get straight after is a feud between him and Ericus. This takes place after one year of them becoming Keyblade Masters. Xehanort is holding the Goat Keyblade or No Name, a Keyblade bequeathed to him from the era of the Lost Masters, explains Ericus. He tries his best to get through Xehanort, and it simply ends up with them clashing. Scene ends. Since we brought up the term Lost Masters, what does it mean exactly? What's its origin? With this term now floating around, especially looking at KH4's new arc, what does it mean? There's a scene with Master Odin and Vidar. Odin explains that the term Lost Masters simply means ancient Keyblade Masters imprisoning true darknesses. In this case, seven most powerful of them imprisoned within them, offering themselves as vessels. That's how the title Lost Masters came to be. And yup, going back to this scene from Union Cross, the Master of Masters explains to Lu Xu just that, using themselves as vessels. 
True darkness is formless, to defeat it, it needs a form. And yeah, what's the deal with that? What is true darkness? Where are these 13 true darknesses? We have two scenes talking about their status, starting with Master Odin's scene with Vidar. Remember, seven are used as vessels by the Lost Masters. Out of the six that remain, Odin states that four were trapped in the realm between of another world, and two of them vanished after the world perished. He does admit that no one really is sure of the truth. This is where Xehanort comes in. He pretty much elaborates Odin's words. Realm in between in this case would refer to the Data world. If you recall this scene in Union Cross, player trapped four true darknesses in Data. Odin saying another world would most likely refer to the Data version of Daybreak Town. What Xehanort adds here is the two darknesses that supposedly vanished after the worlds perished. He seems to believe that one of these two that vanished is hiding within an ally of light. It's also possible that the other supposed vanished one was the one who faced Lu Xu in this scene in Union Cross. But the true darkness we have here, its status is unknown. And hey, since we have Vanitas here, let's talk about him. Right off the bat, we did have a snippet of these two having a discussion in Birth by Sleep. What I'd like to believe is this takes place before that short scene in BBS. This is some time after Xehanort left Ven under Ericus's wing. And yeah, speaking of which, Dark Road does show us an extended scene of Xehanort bringing Ven to Ericus. Xehanort realizes that Ericus now has apprentices, Aqua and Terra. Xehanort believes it's best to have Ven under Ericus's wing going forward, and to be guided by true heir of light. He also thinks he's the one. Seeing as how Xehanort remembers Ven in his dreams ever since he was just a toddler, I'd like to think that the one refers to the child of destiny. Something his caretaker mentioned to him on Destiny Islands. We'll discuss the child of destiny later on in the video. Back to the Vanita scene. After Xehanort talks about one true darkness, possibly hiding in an ally of light, at least that's what he's inclined to believe, he feels one could be hiding in their time. He he then asks Vanitas, a being of darkness, what he thinks about such thing. He feels it doesn't have anything to do with him. Xehanort then goes on about how darkness used to be whole, with our minds being connected once. Which is valid if we go back to this scene from Union Cross. Darkness did say we are many, and we are one. With that notion in mind, Xehanort wants to believe that Vanitas, a being of darkness, should surely know where the others are. Vanitas replies he's his own being, but he still gets questioned. So hypothetically, if Vanitas were a true darkness, why would he hide? Maybe out of fear? Light in this case? Nah, he's not afraid of Ventus. Xehanort brings up an interesting point. Vanitas was not born from Ven's heart being split into light and darkness. He was residing within it, he guesses. If his hypothesis were true, then he wonders where Ven and Vanitas would originate from. He even goes on to tell Vanitas that he dreamt up Ventus when he was a kid, that their meeting couldn't simply be by mere chance. This new scene also seems to resonate with Reminds, the scene with Vanitas, how he described himself, not to mention Sora diving within Ven's heart, where a mysterious voice reached out to him. While Xehanort is on his path towards his Mark of Mastery exam, he explores the dark corridors alone. And what happens here? Well, first, he thinks back to the upperclassmen, how their journey to broaden their horizons brought forth a series of unfortunate events. While walking through these gates, Xehanort senses feelings starting to arise, either a result of first walking through these gates, after leaving the island, or after everything that's happened. He also explains what it actually feels like to walk through these corridors. Although his armor protects him from darkness, he can't help but feel a bit of it seeping through his heart the more he comes here. Him tackling his destiny to feel this way doesn't go according to plan. He passes out. Before we continue, let's fast forward to 65 years later. Old Man Xehanort explains the mechanical properties of Corridors of Darkness. These are bridges which connect each and every world. He explains how one trip to another world is rendered short. 
but there is a hefty cost. These corridors are not meant for people, only for emotion and spirit. These two things draw in others. Attempting to embrace these emotions taints one's heart. That is why coats are important, but Xehanort doesn't follow that. He feels it's for the weak. He still believes that a strong enough heart can withstand such strain. As for Ven, he doesn't have a coat, right? Well, his heart is closed off, which we believe to be a direct result of the creation of Vanitas. Then Xehanort thinks back to what his mentor said. With that memory in mind, he wonders if him embracing these emotions will make him worthy. With that said, let's rewind. Xehanort is passed out, and who comes to the rescue? The Master of Masters. Right before the Master rescues him, he tells to himself that Xehanort's the singularity. Seeing as how this is the Master, you know the Book of Prophecies, his gazing eye and all, he could be referring to the one who wants to side with the darkness. Basically, if I'm getting this right, the Chosen One mentioned in Cage Treaty Secret Report 12 written by Lu Xu, the one who would reenact the Keyblade War, could be the singularity he's talking about. Or singularity really could just be a spur of the moment thing, Xehanort surviving long enough on his own for the Master to show up. Now where does the Master take us? To the Keyblade Graveyard. Looks familiar, doesn't it? This scene is an extended version of the one we have in Remind. We actually get to see the conversation they're having before Xehanort puts on that black coat. The Master figures that Xehanort attempted to test his heart out in darkness. Xehanort wonders why this mystery guy was in the corridors to begin with. Then that leads to them sitting down. The Master says that he used to be a Keyblade Master, more or less. Xehanort doubts him, and poof, the Master apparently can hold and summon anyone's Keyblade at will. I don't want to use the word wield here, he just happens to hold it for a few seconds. Now him summoning it reminds me of that scene with Riku in Hollow Bastion in the first game. Riku in this case was originally meant to wield it. Let's not forget Terra put Riku through that inheritance ceremony in BBS. Since Riku fell to darkness, Keyblade chose Sora instead. Back to the point. The conversation then moves to how to protect oneself from darkness. The Master explains that this black coat provides better protection than his armor and is free of charge. Then Xehanort brings out how he's on the path towards the Mark of Mastery. The Master of Masters, clueless of such term, tells Xehanort to take a peek at people's hearts. And then he goes on talking about human emotions. This is where he first brings up the term false light. We weren't quite sure what that meant in Remind, but here we are now with a better understanding of what he meant. False light simply has to do with human feelings. Like love, for example, are these messy feelings light or darkness? Then we have these different categories, how people's darkness bubbles to the surface when dragging others down. One has power, and the other does not. Those with power harbor feelings of superiority and judgment. The weak ones who fear the strong ones wish to strip them of their power. So which one is Xehanort? Xehanort feels people shouldn't be categorized like that. The Master feels what he's asking Xehanort to do will help him indeed broaden his horizons. Peeking at people's hearts pretty much. He waits until Xehanort comes back from his trip to broaden his horizons. So what happens next? We get the same exact scene from Remind. So pretty much Dark Road gave us more context. And no, we still don't know what his name is. I mean, are we really that surprised that they kept it a mystery? Alrighty, let's move on to something else. How does one summon Kingdom Hearts? Going off the context of Dark Road, this scene with Vidar and Odin tells us that to summon Kingdom Hearts, there needs to be seven true lights shining amidst the darkness of chaos. We'd like to think Odin is referring to the 13 darknesses here. Not true darknesses necessarily. After all, if you think about it, Xehanort summoned Kingdom Hearts in Cage 3 by having seven lights clash with 13 darknesses. Odin also tells Vidar that KH is too much of an extreme. So much, in fact, it could purge the worlds. Even with Kingdom Hearts, the chances of destroying darkness is not guaranteed. It's forbidden. Vidar at a point hints at wanting to summon Kingdom Hearts. At least Xehanort was inclined to believe so. He explains to the crew, to defeat true darkness, they need to gather seven lights. Now what ultimately led to the conversation of Kingdom Hearts, really? 
Vidar mentions that if they lose anyone else, he won't be able to face his friend. Who is this friend he speaks of? It's most likely Balder. Let's talk about him. Going back to the events in the underworld, everyone gets sucked into a dark gate or corridor. This didn't just randomly manifest. This was done by Balder, who for some time has been taken over by darkness. Right before the scene ends, Hades turns around and says, You? Judging from his facial expression, he seems confused. Perhaps confused about how someone he wanted to imprison could summon a random portal like that. Now look, the scene doesn't show us who he's referring to, but it's possible it's simply Balder. One who Hades deemed a permanent resident of the underworld. Balder could have made sure not to have any survivors among the 13 lights. So what's this 13 lights I keep mentioning? Well, it simply refers to our characters in this story. Baldur was so eager to get rid of all these lights. Ericus and Xehanort survived long enough for Odin to find them. Ericus brings up Bragi and Baldur, who were also in the Underworld. Not knowing about their status, Odin puts emphasis on Baldur. Before he continues, havoc starts to happen. He heads out and wields the Keyblade that's hanging up top. He urges our duo to stay in class, and this is when Xehanort believes that Baldur's behind all this. How could this happen? He believes it's due to the trauma of losing his sister Hodor. Ericus refuses to stay behind, wants to deal with Baldur. Xehanort follows. Vidar, Vali, and Vala show up. Xehanort mentions Baldur's status to the trio, and Vidar knew this whole time. He knew that his friend Baldur was chosen as a vessel, and he just couldn't take his life. Ericus is angry. They all battle it out. Vidar mentions he tried relying on Kingdom Hearts to try and save Baldur. In the end, he changed his mind. After mentioning Ver, reporting back to Odin, Baldur shows up. Xehanort physically feels pain within him, sensing that Baldur did in fact get consumed by darkness. Why did this affect him? Well, all we do know is that scene which we discussed previously, how Xehanort can feel darkness seeping through his heart as he walked through those corridors. That could be resonating here. Baldur leaves for the tower. The upperclassmen decide they should rescue Ver. But that doesn't stop our duo from catching up to them. And now this is where things start to unravel. Ver finds Baldur. Before anything drastic happens, we get flashbacks to him mourning the death of his sister Hodor. He simply sinks deeper and deeper into his sorrow and starts having these intrusive thoughts. So much, in fact, that darkness is attracted to him, completely clouding his judgment. All that mattered now was to make the 13 lights disappear. Notice how I said darkness was attracted to him and not born from within him. Baldur, or this darkness in this case, tells Ver that he actually struck Hodor, as well as everyone else. If this darkness was born from Baldur, why even kill his sister then, right? All this is a result of him losing his sister after all. That's how this darkness found its way inside Baldur. So when we first saw Hodor, the story made us believe it was Maleficent who killed her. But this frame with darkness in it doesn't have Maleficent in it. We clearly see darkness killing her here. Same for everyone else. As for Bragi, well, we know that's Lushu, so he could have pretended to die. And now, he goes after the rest. They all die. Except for Ericus and Xehanort. Ver shares her last words and apologizes for leaving her friends. Baldur or Darkness redirects the fight somewhere more worthy of the occasion, the rooftop. Could be or could be not the same area we had in Cage 3 after facing Xehanort. What matters here is Darkness's ultimate goal, to try and summon Kingdom Hearts, thinking it will reshape the world in Darkness. The fact this Darkness went after everyone was to try and persuade Vidar to summon Kingdom Hearts. He knew Vidar wouldn't hurt his friend, so Darkness believed Vidar would stick to Kingdom Hearts. After Vidar changed his mind, Darkness decided to take matters into his own hands and just kill every 13 lights on sight. So wait a minute, what exactly is this Darkness of Baldur's? Is it a true darkness, using him as a vessel? Well, yes, but actually no. Yes, he's being used as a vessel here, but the darkness in him is not a true darkness as stated here. He then questions Xehanort's heart, 
Is he sure that it's not even tainted by a hint of shadow? Then he talks about how him with Xehanort and Baldur with his sister cast shadows with their light and beget darkness. Once that light is gone, they drown in the void. That's basically how this darkness right here came to be. It's an amalgamation of the fear and shadow that lurks deep within everyone's heart. And this right here, Darkness says that he's not born from Baldur's heart, but from everyone's. Baldur has a sensitive heart, so much in fact it felt the darkness born from everyone's devotion to light. That's pretty much how this darkness and true darknesses came to be. Hodder, who borrowed Xehanort's heart, tries to get through to Baldur. Baldur explains that he could sense what was in people's hearts. The more darkness he felt, the more he sank into the abyss. He at a point realizes that the darkness he felt was truly his own. So much in fact he thought he could just not avoid it anymore. Two types of people here. He says people like Hodder and Ericus, who he deemed light, and people like him. Their heartwarming reunion doesn't last. Baldur goes back to his previous darker self and Odin steps in. An interesting note here, these chains seem to be an ability which gets passed down and not necessarily tied to the master's defender. Sure, Aqua had this Keyblade in 0.2, but that could have simply been her having knowledge of such ability. Thinking back to KH Force teaser trailer, Sora seems to be using chains, so it could really be an ability that's learned or passed down. Anywho, back to the point. Hodder uses whatever strength she has to slow Baldur down. He shares his last words before being struck down by Xehanort. He sees himself in Xehanort and tells him to seek answers to the darkness. Xehanort, the seeker of darkness. Clever wording here. Moving on to a different topic, Ericus shares his dream with Xehanort. He tells him that his dream is to stay true to the light. In case anyone finds themselves lost in the darkness, he wants to be a beacon that guides them back. This could resonate with this scene from BBS. After Xehanort takes over Terra's body, he senses a familiar light, and that's Ericus. Ericus was killed by Xehanort, if you recall. Xehanort delivered the final blow. This was confirmed in BBS's Ultimania, if that wasn't ever made clear. Ericus also appeared out of Terra after we battled Xehanort in KH3. So Ericus' dream of being a beacon, I mean, that's not what really brought Terra back. If anything, Ericus acting as a beacon of light within Terra could explain Terra's heart never actually being lost forever. Now before Ericus dreamed of becoming a beacon to guide others back, he had another dream. That dream, as Xehanort states here, was to travel abroad. Especially with everything that's happened. And this is where Xehanort starts sharing his own dream. Xehanort feels that one lifetime is too short. Ericus makes a point here. You only get one so you have to live it to the fullest. But Xehanort feels it ain't enough. Instead of having others follow his legacy, he'd rather do it himself. How many lifetimes does he dream of? Not 12, but 13. He feels 13 will help rebuild the world, but you know, he decides to add an extra. So we have 14 lifetimes. The 14th lifetime being about exploring the new world. This is where I bring up Nomura's special artwork commemorating Dark Road's finale. We have Xehanort, with his original grey eyes, wearing casual clothing it seems. Hmm. Aitai Kimochi on Twitter quoted a user's analysis. This user seems to believe that Xehanort is in an area similar to our Miyashita Park in Shibuya. New world, eh? Is Nomura planning to have Xehanort live a life in Quadratum? After all, Quadratum, according to Strelitzia, is the afterworld. Whether or not 13 lifetimes would be him using vessels to summon Kingdom Hearts, you know, fragments of his heart being placed in everyone, each placed in different lifetimes to sort of speak, I mean, that's up in the air, but it could be it. But the 14th one, him wanting to explore the new world? He never said, uh. He said the, as if he's implying a world in particular. That world being Quadratum, the afterlife. A world of fiction. Okay, but didn't uh, the Xehanort saga end? It did. But Nomura won't shy away from still acknowledging Xehanort. And this takes us to question 13 of the Q&A. 
Lastly, will Xehanort appear again in a future title? The Dark Seeker saga which hinged on Xehanort is now over. However, this doesn't have bearing on whether he will or won't appear. At this point, it's up to whether there is a good opportunity. And uh, come to think of it. Xehanort wanting other lifetimes could have been influenced by his caretaker, since he did live two lifetimes. We'll discuss that scene shortly. Moving on to a different topic, the Disney worlds of Dark Road. For those who perhaps scratched their heads, confused about the timeline, like how we have the Beast and Jafar, for example, looking exactly the same as they did 75 years later into the future. Wait, 75 years? Well, it seems like it. Xehanort bringing Ven to Ericus happened 65 years later, around the timeline of Birth by Sleep. If we take a look at this scene from Fragmentary Passage, Aqua's been in the Realm of Darkness for 10 years, explains Mickey, since time in the Realm of Darkness and the Realm of Light, they differ. So yes, around 75 years later, these characters look the same. So what's happening here? This isn't data, or worlds being conjured by the Book of Prophecies. So what is it? Well, we just answered it. Time flows differently in each world. This was actually explained in episode 1, before embarking on our journey. Since we're talking about worlds here, I just want to say that Disney worlds weren't this relevant to the plot ever since KH1. Hades, for example, us looking for our friends who disappeared, the Rose, and the Lamp. Not to mention Xehanort talking to the Mirror and looking desperate. The mirror telling him where Ventus is out of everything. I'm hoping KH4 goes back to that feeling, having the actual story of Kingdom Hearts flow within the actual Disney worlds. Alright, since time flows differently in each world, what about the emblem Heartless? They were created in the future by Apprentice Xehanort, so what gives? Even our trio tried understanding how Emblem Heartless were present. They were aware that they used to be conjured by the Book of Prophecies. Let's move to question 4. In Dark Road, several of the Emblem Heartless make an appearance, but we thought that they would only appear later in the series. No more explained, the reason of their appearance in these past worlds will be explained in Missing Link. So there you go. Moving on to the secret ending, Xehanort's caretaker mentions the Child of Destiny, Xehanort being that child. This Child of Destiny is described as someone special who saves the world from darkness. Xehanort in this case would meet and interact with many people. All these encounters would basically lead him on his destined path. Hmm. Although he feels that Xehanort will be the Child of Destiny, the depiction of it just seems to resonate with someone else. And that someone could be Sora. Sora, the one who changed destiny, letting light prevail and darkness expire. He says so himself here. He sometime during his life learned that darkness would prevail and light expire. The child of destiny would change that outcome. Sora seems to fit this whole scenario, and not to mention the connections Sora has created throughout his life. This guy also mentions how this child of destiny would connect their heart with another to become one. It could be a reference to Ven and how his heart was fractured after Venitas was born. All in all, this robed person could simply be wrong. His gut or feeling could just be wrong. The only thing he got right is the fact that Xehanort would eventually leave this island. And the reality is, we all know that Xehanort ultimately chose the path of darkness to achieve his goal. Now shortly after, Xehanort brings up his mom, wonders whether or not he'd get the chance to meet her when he gets strong enough. He doesn't really remember her, but is aware that he has a mom. If we rewind to this scene, we have a lady giving away her child to this robed guy, at least entrusting this person to take care of her child. As for why she gave him away is not clear. But one thing you've probably asked yourself, is that woman scald? From quick glance the hair reminds us of her, but the eyes don't match. Before I add on to this, let me bring up question 10 of the Q&A. Xehanort appears with a figure who we assume to be his mother. Is that... Scald? That is incorrect. However, she is related to Scald in some way. The next title, Missing Link, will have bloodlines as one of the story's main points. So that's not Scald. That we can scratch off the list, but there is one thing. If this woman is related to Scald in some way, then who is Girl X or Subject X really? For quite some time, many of us perhaps believed that the girl Isa and Lee knew of, and the one who was described in the secret reports in KH3, we thought it'd be Scald. 
We never knew where she wound up after using a lifeboat in Union Cross's finale, so naturally that had reinforced the theory of Subject X being Skulled. So now we ask ourselves, could Ava have been Subject X? Who could that girl possibly be? Earlier in the video, we mentioned the fact that Xehanort had these dreams about kids which he never knew about. Robed Guy gets curious. Xehanort goes on describing these kids which he dreamt of. The last description, this other person, reminded him of his caretaker. He feels that Xehanort can sense what's in the hearts of others. This is where we start to realize who this robed guy really is. I've experienced much in my two lifetimes, some of which I've shared with you. Feeling there's much more to tell and perhaps it's time, he goes on to describe his two lifetimes. The first one he mentions, the Book of Prophecies, how it was given to a dear friend. The part of his life he's referring to is most likely this scene from Union Cross. Brain gave the book to Ephemer, so already we can sense that Ephemer is the friend he was referring to. Who else was there looking back at this scene? Player, us. Who was the blue-robed figure seen in the epilogue of Dark Road? It's the player. Or, to be more specific, it's the vessel, where the player's heart has started its second lifetime on. Therefore, whenever someone disappears, it's not that they're entirely gone. Rather, their heart has melted into another person. Player learned that light was to expire and darkness prevail. Paying close attention to this setting, this is looking to be player's second life. In Missing Link this time, us being the player in Missing Link. Remember, Missing Link acts as a bridge game when it comes to Union Cross and Dark Road. Kingdom Hearts Missing Link is a work that fills in the blank period and bridges them together. I guess we can all agree that Missing Link at least takes place prior to Dark Road. Us, the player, we grow older with time and uh, time comes where we become Xehanort's caretaker. At some point during his storytelling, he mentions that Xehanort's great-great-grandfather was a renowned Keyblade wielder. Him saying that means they had a great connection back then. But who could this great-great-grandfather be? Well, if we fast forward, Xehanort's gotten older, and the time has come for his caretaker or player in this case, we discussed that before, they feel their end of time has come. He reminisces Xehanort's dreams, how those kids in his dream are a precious memory he holds dear. You saw what you felt within my heart. And if we quickly jump to this sequence, I say this with conviction because coursing through your veins is the blood of Ephemer, a dear friend of mine. Connecting the dots here, Ephemer seems to be Xehanort's ancestor, his great, great grandfather. Recall Nomura's statement about the hearts melting into others. Whose heart did he melt into next? Now remember, Missing Link will have story beats about bloodlines explained to Nomura during the Q&A. You might ask yourself, how did his caretaker, or player, predict or foretell Xehanort's future? Did player have access to the Book of Prophecies? I mean, going off the very likely possibility of us being player in Missing Link, aka his second lifetime? Then Ephemer giving him access to the book wouldn't really make sense, because Ephemer would already be deceased during that time. Player did know about darkness prevailing, but that could have simply been a word-to-mouth scenario. If anything, Player talking about Xehanort's future could simply be his heart talking. Anywho, with that said and done, this is it for the video. If you're interested in the whole commemorative Q&A for the finale, a link will be placed in the description below. If you have questions, your own theories, feel free to share it in the comments section below. And as always, thank you so much for the support on here and thank you for watching. I have been Vivi, and until next time.